some teachers will straight up tell you, you know, this is this is garbage. I remember one brother was, um, it sounded like, because this was on board this year, it was on Zoom. So we were all at home while we were doing studies, but it sounded like he was crying. It seemed like he was crying because the teacher really ripped into his stuff. And we didn't know if he was going to make it. We didn't know about a few of us. You know, a few of us who was in that group, we didn't know because some people's work wasn't up to standard. In the West, do they get that same type of stress? Or is it just as long as you got your aid, your financial aid, or your money that you can go forth? This, the, this, the, the, the teachers here, they really looked at the um, academic level of the student. So mm-hmm. if, you don't, if you're not up to par, then you can't go and say, I'm studying a master's in German to Imam. I don't know how it is in other universities, but they will not allow you to go on to write your risala. And even when you put your risala forward, that has to be accepted. So you have to put, uh, you know, the thesis that you want to write, you have to put it in a way that could be understood on an academic level. And it has to be a proficiency. And then once you put it forth, they can say, this is completely garbage. We don't want it. Come up with something new. Or they can critique it to how it should be a little better. But I've had people tell me they put forth maybe four different things, five different things, all of them getting refused. Does that happen, you know, in the West? I don't know. But all I know is the studies here is definitely more intense from what I've seen. Um, It's definitely more um, competitive. Uh, It's a lot. It's, It's a lot. يا طالب العلم قم لتنم فإن الزمان انقضى وانصرم فكن ما حييت ضنينا به فظنك بالوقت بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم اغفر لنا ولوالدينا وللسامعين ولجميع المسلمين أجمعين الحمد لله رب العالمين this day and this blessed month of Ramadan and Allah the Almighty blesses us day in day out Alhamdulillah, today I'm joined by one of my dear brothers, Brother Abdul Hamid, Edge from America, um, currently in Riyadh. So, brother, if you can just start, inshallah, by introducing yourself to the viewers. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, rasulillah. Now, Zakhla Khiyakhi, first and foremost, for having me. Uh, I'm honored to be here with you and, you know, be joined on this podcast. And yes, my name is Abdul Hamid, Edge. Um, some brothers know me as Abu Mu'ayyab. Some people know me as Abu Zainab. Um, I'm currently studying here in Riyadh from Pittsburgh, PA. I am currently in the master's program. And uh, my major is in Aqidah. Mark, I love you. Obviously, um, what, before I actually get into you studying in Riyadh, I'd like to kind of find out the, your journey into accepting Islam. So if you can actually just let us know when did that happen, why did that happen, and just generally the story behind it. Yeah, um, <laughs> the journey to Islam was, uh, that's a long story, but I'll try to give the, the you know, the shortened version, which was that um, probably around like 15, 16, I was very, very heavily into the church, you know, so I was a Christian uh, from like the church, they call it the Church of God in Christ, so I was very close connected, you know, going to church every Sunday, you know, going to Bible studies every Tuesday, you know, men's choir, youth, you know, uh, programs, et cetera, brothers, keepers. And, um, you know, uh, something had took place, you know, uh, not going into it too, too much, but with family. So I had moved from my mother's house to my grandmother's house. And even before that, like, I was very, like, I was always kind of like on the edge when I was going to like, uh, when I was going to like, you know, the Bible studies, et cetera, on Tuesday, we used to always, you know, ask a lot of questions, me and some other youth who used to attend. And we were generally, you know, we wanted to learn because we found different things very, very interesting, you know, about, uh, you know, the Christianity, especially when we start, you know, studying a little bit more. But there were some things that would never make sense. So in these things, we would always make sure when they came up, we would always like, you know, pin them and try to get it, you know, a clear answer on it, especially when we're talking about, you know, the hellfire and Jenna, et cetera. So uh, when this happened, we would ask, and they would pretty much say, you know, uh, you have to believe. You know, you have to believe in it. There's some things you just have to accept. So <laughs> me, obviously, I'm like, okay, this is weird. How am I going to be calling my friends to this? And you're just telling me I have to believe? So uh, that kind of turned me off. And even, like, some of my family members, we'd always discuss it because they used to come to the Bible studies as well. And we would discuss it. And before, they were like, yeah, I under- honestly didn't understand that either. And, but I was the most outspoken, you know, in the church or from the youth, uh, you know, in that time. And uh, 
that happened. So we, I was always kind of like had some shit. I always had some doubt. And then a uh, thing happened where I had moved out of my mother's house and I was able to more so look into different religions because I wasn't going to that church as frequently. So I didn't never like look on Islam specifically, but I was looking at, you know, different things with the, you know, the Jews say about this, what does Islam say about this, what does Christianity say about this, comparative religions type of study. And then um, it's just by the color of Allah, the next year, maybe seven, when I was 17 or 18, I was in my last year of high school, which I think you guys call college there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was in that year where I started looking into Islam. I had a friend who, you know, was calling me to come to the masjid, come and, you know, check out the khutbah, co- co- check out the classes, etc. So I was like, okay, you know, I came. And when I came to Juma, I think this was probably in December, you know, I attended the khutbah and I was like, wow, uh, it was it was something like amazing to me. You know, I came, I had, you know, my my Jesus Peace necklace on, you know, I had my, you know, my pants dragging on the floor, my new Jordans on, et cetera. You know, just you know, a young kid, you know. Yeah. Last so, year, I mean, <laughs> so so I think is this at the stage of what? How old were you at this stage? You were still confused. I, yeah, at this time I was probably uh seventeen now. I was seventeen because I graduated high school at seventeen. So yeah, I was seventeen then. And that's when I was living with my grandmother. So I was kind of like, I was working. I was really busy. You know, I was really active at that time. Mm-hmm. So I came, I checked it out. This is like December, January-ish. And then after that, I was like, wow, this was nice. And I never, I never missed a Juma after that. Even mm-hmm. if I, and I was, and I wasn't Muslim. So I was coming up until maybe April or May, something like this. And I was attending, you know, frequently, even the classes on Fridays, I was attending. And the thing that stuck out to, stuck out to me was the fact that that everything was backed up with proof and evidence. Like nobody can speak. Like I'm talking about from the knowledge, the knowledgeable people to the uh, wham, the regular people, the general folk. Nobody can speak except that they had some type of evidence. So, so I that's the uh, sorry to cut you. You're talking about no, it's okay. From December until April, that's like five months. You're coming as a non-Muslim to the masjid. What made you come frequently? Yeah, what made me come so frequent is the fact that, like, uh, you know, I was previously studying, you know, religion prior to that. So I was already a frequent in the church prior, the years prior. So me being, me taking a liking to, to a religion wasn't hard, but okay. me taking a liking to this religion was, was, was something new because like I said, everyone was speaking with Quran and so on. Everybody was speaking with facts, actual evidence. So when people spoke, I was like amazed, you know, you know, God says this, they were saying Allah says this in the Quran. And I was like, wow, the prophet said this in an authentic hadith. Wow. And the same questions, some of them same questions, which I was previously unaware of in Christianity, it seemed like it was so easy. It was so clear. I didn't need to guess. I didn't need to just believe in it. It was like, wow, this is, this, there it is. Class, this is, this is what I want to be with, you know? So uh, that's what happened. And all the years I was going, all the months, I'm sorry, I was going and I wasn't Muslim. So it wasn't until after I graduated high school, which was probably around May-ish, June-ish. And then I was getting ready to go into university. And then I was praying one day and because uh, I used to pray with them as well. I was a Muslim. I was praying with them in the ranks. I liked the, the environment. I liked the brothers. I liked the togetherness. I liked all of it. Mm-hmm. And then somebody, somebody tapped on my shoulder and was like, I was lining up. They're calling me, I was lining up. They're like, uh, bro, did you take your shahada yet? And I was like, no, nah, I'm still just, you know, studying. I'm still looking into it. <laughs> and he was like, he was like, oh, man, you can't pray with us. And I was like what like this is this is months going on you know what you mean i can't pray so he's like yeah you know that's you know <laughs> man i bless the brother he was like you know that's a gap that's a gap in us ranks and you know you can't you can't you know pray with us so you know just go ahead and sit to the side until you take a shahada and i was like upset i remember being so upset and just so let down i was waiting outside as they're praying i'm like what is this so the brother one of the brothers came out who you know was in charge of the message i think he was the president of the message at the time he came out. He's like, what's up? You know, what's, what's wrong with you? He's seen that I was, you know, messed up. Yeah. I said, like, man, that's brother so-and-so. He told me I can't pray. And I was like, why? He's like, he's like, you know, because I, I ain't take my shahada yet. And I was like, he's like, you didn't take your shahada? He, the whole time, all these months, he thought I was Muslim. So no one knew I, that you didn't take your shahada. You know, <laughs> I think people were like afraid to ask because I was lined up in prayer and I was attending, you know, the, the, the salawat and I'm attending the khutbah and I'm a more of a frequent than a lot of brothers, you know? So, mm-hmm. um, I think they were a bit shy to ask. So when he said that, I was like, yeah, I was like, no, I didn't take my shahada yet. He was like, well, what you waiting for? And when he said that, it kind of like all my anger kind of went away. I was like thinking to myself, well, why am I waiting? You know, like I couldn't answer like, 
what's what's the big issue? You know, I, I believe in everything I'm hearing. So the next day, I think it was Juma uh, or something, maybe it might have been Saturday. It might have been a class. I can't remember at this time. But I took Shahada. The brother, the imam came and we sat in the back and he read me, the, you know, the Shahada, et cetera. And Alhamdulillah, welcome me to Islam. And Alhamdulillah, that's how I accept okay. Islam. I have that feeling that I want to ask two questions. The first one was um, at the time when you were constantly, frequently going there, constantly day in, day out, you know, Juma, yeah. Juma. Is it a thing mm. there where you just needed some sort of like, like answer you're waiting for in order for you to actually accept it? Did you know, was, was that you doing research at the time? Did you know what Shahada meant or you were just trying it out? Yeah, I think for me, the biggest thing that helped me back was, um, you know, growing up in that type of environment, like how I was so active in the church, hearing that, you know, Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, was, you know, the son of God. And, you know, he died for your sins. I think that was the thing that coming to Islam, seeing that he was a prophet, I wanted to make sure I fully believe in that statement right there, that he's a prophet and he is a messenger of Allah, uh, and I just didn't want to enter into it with mixed feelings. So I wanted to make sure that door was completely closed before entering a new door. So I knew that like me becoming a Muslim, I can't hold that belief. So I really wanted to keep learning more about Isa, more about the story, more about how that was, you know, solidified. And then I wanted to feel comfortable doing it. But I think I, somewhere along them few months, I, I lost the train of thought. And I just, I, I knew I believed it. You know, he was a prophet. He was a messenger. But I was still, didn't take the Shahada. <laughs> mm. <I lost. laughs> and the second question I'll ask, mm. the actual moment when you took that Shahada, mm. how did you feel? Like what was the what, what was what was going through you? Uh, for me, yeah, for me, I think it was just like uh, alhamdulillah, finally, you know. I think even the brothers, they were like, finally, because everybody thought I was a Muslim already, and I pretty much felt like I was at home. You know, I was already hanging out with some of the Muslims who was coming to the masjid. I'm already speaking to some of the elders in the community. I'm already, you know, trying to learn and get. I had their numbers. I'm speaking with them, you know, outside throughout the week. So I think it was kind of like just finally, alhamdulillah, welcome, you know. And I was like, yeah, alhamdulillah, you know, it feels good. It feels good. <laughs> alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. May Allah preserve you. And also, what I want to ask you is that at the time, um, obviously, you don't have to answer this. We don't answer, but in terms of your family members and your household, how did they kind of take it when you were studying and trying to learn about different religions, and when you kind of, um, you know, kept going there constantly? And in, and in terms of afterwards, how did they kind of react to you actually accepting Islam? Yeah, I think um, uh, generally a lot of people were kind of like, oh, OK, that's interesting. Uh, my father, he was he was kind of cool with it. My father kind of like had a background of being around Muslims, you know, and he also uh, was in a situation where he's seen a lot of Muslims. So he was kind of familiar with the, the background. Um, my mother, though, uh, and some of my closest family members who were in the church with me at the time, they took it a bit a bit hard, obviously, you know, because I'm coming from this background of being in, you know, the men's choir, the youth, you know, youth uh, choir, the Bible studies, the Sunday schools, the, you know, all these different, you know, activities. And mm -hmm. now I'm completely switching that and taking on a new religion. So I think that was kind of a shock for some of my, some of my close family members, specifically my mother at the time. So it was a, it was a bit difficult. But, how did but alhamdulillah, I, later it came, it came around and alhamdulillah, everything's good now and everything... And we're all we're all in we're all okay. Alhamdulillah, Allah But in terms of like now at that stage, because what I want to highlight, because a lot of you know people that accept Islam find it difficult, mm -hmm. especially in the beginning stages. Some of them maybe give up and actually you know go back to that which they were upon because of the fact that they don't know how to handle actually you know relating the news and mm -hmm. being with their family members, especially if that some of the family members are staunch against Islam. So how do okay. you kind of go about? just carrying on and believing and following your faith? Um, for me, I think I was a bit, um, at that time when I accepted Islam, I was going into university. So uh, it was kind of an easy transition to a certain extent because I was already, you know, to American standards, I'm grown. You know, I'm going into another life now, about to live on campus. And I was already kind of separated from the people who had a lot of, for my family members who were like not happy about it. You know, I was, my grandmother was completely okay. And that's who I was living with at the time before I went to university. So for me, um, I, I never had a problem going against the grain, if that's okay to say, 
So it was like, you know, listen, this is what it is. This is, you know, this is what I am. You know, I still love all y'all, y'all, my family members, but this is what I believe to be true. And I, and I had proof and evidence and I had, you know, the translation of the Quran and in the back of the translation, uh, there was a whole bunch of different, like, not, I don't, it's not the base, but it was answered to different doubts, you know? So that was very helpful for me because when I had like family meetings or something, I might bring it up and they're like, oh no, not again, not this. But I was so like, you know, how do you say I wanted to just teach them. I wanted to go on and say, yeah, this is what it is. But um, so it wasn't difficult. And they didn't make it difficult upon me. So it wasn't it wasn't a hard transition to be like shy away from. You know, I was completely 100 percent firm in what I believed and what I want to do moving forward, which was be a Muslim and be a punk and a sunnah. Alhamdulillah. So what pieces of advice would you give to those that, you know, face a different um, kind of scenario to yours in terms of like their family members? you know, are completely against them accepting Islam. How would you advise them? Because obviously you've gone through the kind of stage of accepting Islam. How would you advise them in terms of being fair? Yeah, I would say, I would say move with hikmah, move with wisdom. Don't be quick. You know, um, sometimes a lot of us who first take our shahada, we're very, very eager to push all this new knowledge in which we're learning upon others. And some people can be a bit aggressive with it. Some people can be a little too much. And um, I made some mistakes along that way. I would say just move with hikmah, move with wisdom, see when the time is okay to let these, your family members know about your faith. And um, also um, just, you know, don't, don't do anything except that uh, it might cause more harm, you know? So speak to maybe people who went through it, speak to uh, people who might can advise you to move with, you know, knowledge and proper action. Cause you can make a situation worse. You know, some brothers, they go through a situation with their family members and um, years later, it's still kind of sour because of how, you know, eager they came in, you know, with the Quran and the Sunnah and, you know, giving everybody a translated Quran and saying what they're going to do and what they're not going to do and what's wrong and what's right. And Christmas is this. And and it's, it's too much for a lot of the family members. You know, we have to be very, very kind and uh, gentle with our family members. They remember they're, they're from your family. They love you. And, you know, they're shocked just to see that this is a change in your life. So move with wisdom. Exactly. Okay, now it kind of moves me to the next question. Why okay. Saudi Arabia? Why Jamaat al Imam? Why did you? Yeah. Want to, how did that come about? Yeah. So uh, it's so this there's so much that took place between you know when I first became Muslim and I took Shahada to when uh, Saudi came into play. So if I can just real briefly go into it because there's a lot of dots that are in there. So what happened was you know after I took Shahada, you know brothers were really encouraging me to, you know, seek knowledge, you know, seek knowledge and, um, you know, learn Arabic first and foremost. And I was going to university my first year, you know, in university, and I wanted to be a dentist at the time. So I was studying biology. And obviously, as a new Muslim, um, living on campus, it was very difficult. You know, I, I got into it and I, re and I realized, like, this isn't for me. So I left after the first year. Uh, and I'm giving this very, very short because, you know, time, of course. Uh, so then I went into nursing school. And then after that, I realized that I want to go and learn Arabic. So I saved up my money when I was working in the, the hospital and um, I went to Egypt. So when I went to Egypt, I did a summer course and I was married at this time. I did a summer course, an intensive summer course. And then I, uh, along that journey, I went to make Umrah in yeah, Saudi, of course. So when you mean uh, intensive summer course in the Arabic language, it's some religion or... Yeah, so it was a, it was a uh, it was a intensive course at a marquez in in Egypt, which was Marquez al Fajr, and I was, you know, I was a new Muslim. I just Google, and that's what popped up. So I was like, okay, this looks okay. I seen some reviews, saved up some money. Egypt was pretty cheap at the time. I think this was 2011, 2011 maybe. You know, so that's when I went, and then I also had went to uh, Saudi Arabia while I was there. I made Umrah. I'm like, I'm on the side of the world. You know, I might as well go and make Umrah. So I did that as well. And then when I was there, subhanAllah, when I first, you know, seen a Kaaba, when I first got into Mecca, the hot weather, et cetera, I'm just like, this is, this is love. This is nice. You know, I like this. I like the environment. I like seeing everybody with the thoves and the kufis and just, you know, the students, et cetera. And I just made dua that Allah to Ta'ala make me from amongst the students who can live in this country. So when I made that dua, uh, when I went back, literally within uh, half a year, I got accepted to Medina University. So alhamdulillah, I went, yeah, so alhamdulillah, I went to Medina, um, and I'm skipping on a, a lot of details, but, you know, going to the point of how I get to Jamatim Imam, 
I went to Medina in 2012. I was a, I was a new student in the Mahad. And uh, yeah, I went there and I stayed for a semester. So what happened was I was married at the time. So they, at that time, mm-hmm. they would have the family situation all locked up. This is, 2012, right? this is 2012, yeah. So they had the family situation all locked up. You couldn't bring family on Iqama. Brothers were bringing their family on Umrah visas and staying in. But of course, that caused much more problems. And yeah, don't want to get into that. But some brothers did it. I wasn't ab- upon that. So I just, you know, kept making dua that Allah opens up something. I can bring my family. You know, I just had my my daughter at that time, my first daughter. And um, it was somewhere within that yeah. first semester at the Mahad that uh, somebody had called me. I can't remember if it was a student in Jamaat Imam or uh, somebody back in the states. And they said, "Bro, you just got accepted to Jamaat Imam as well." And I was like, "What?" Well, I forgot you that I... when you were in Medina or when you were back in USA. Or yeah. Egypt? So, yeah. So when I was in when I was back in um, Egypt when I went came here to make Umrah, I applied to Umrah Qura. and I think somewhere along my trip or when I got back, I sent my documents to the brothers who were in Jamaat Imam. And also, I applied online. They had the online thing at the time for Jam for Jam Islamia in Medina. So I did that as soon as I got back after applying to Umar Qura. So they all got applied to at the same time, but the acceptance came later for Jam Imam. So that's what happened. I got the call when I was in Medina, and I'm like, okay, but obviously you don't want to leave Medina. Medina was is beautiful. You know, you have scholars everywhere. You have you know the students everywhere. The city is. It, it, it's, it's booming, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a ni'mah, okay? it's, it's a ni'mah, truly. Like, there's so many lessons. You can be in a lesson literally after every salat if you really want to. And you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know. So um, I didn't want to leave there, but also I had responsibility. I had family, which was fard, you know, that's a, that's a fard aina upon me. So I went and I was like, okay, let me not completely throw Jamal to my mouth the window. Let me go visit Riyal. So I visited while I was still a student in Jamal Islamiyah. I was like, okay, this is okay. And, you know, the big thing was brothers, like, you could bring your family. You know, the, the economy situation is open. And, you know, you can give them a family visitor visa as well. And and I was like, oh, man. All right. Let me go. You're putting a predicament. You're putting a, brick in, in a predicament. What should I do? What should I do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, it, was, it was difficult because um, Medina was love, man. It was, it, was, it, was, it was beautiful. But obviously, it was, at being a new student in Medina, it was also a bit difficult as well for, from my aspect of, you know, being a new Muslim and getting there and there's so much stuff going on. You know, you don't know who you should sit with as far as, you know, which the rules are more important. You're trying to do the mahad, but then you all got brothers in your ear, you know, all the stuff between brothers, don't go there, don't go there, et cetera. Mm. So um, Riyadh was calm though. It didn't have to that extent, you know, it, was, it wasn't like, you know, you're automatically thrown on type of some type of battlefield amongst some brothers and what's going on between them. So, I liked that aspect, and I also liked the fact that I can bring family. That was the most important. So I prayed a sakata, and it wasn't an easy decision. Well, like, it, it was very difficult. And I, sometimes I even look back and still like, you know, how would things would have been? But, you know, you can't look at Qadr Allah, Mashafah, that's from Allah's hikmah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, yeah, then that's when I went back. I prayed a sakata. I took Khuruj Nihai. And I remember I went to the, the Idara. I went to the administration building, and they're like, I had a brother with me because my Arabic was very weak at the time. Obviously, I'm in Musawa Awal in the Mahal. And, you know, the workers like, Khuruj Nihai, you sure? You don't want uh, Tajil? You don't want to, like, you know, delay your studies? You don't want to think about it? You know, Khuruj Nihai, you're completely out the system. That's the final answer. What, so, what, what month was this exactly? Do you remember in 2012? Because I was there in 2012. Yeah, 2012, I think this might have been. Um, so we came, we came in the wintertime. I remember because I was sick. So we came in the middle of the semester. So it was 2012, the beginning of 2012. And um, yeah, so the beginning of 2012. So I came probably December, January. I remember coming, it was kind of cold. And Medina, the Medina coldness was a bit different. It was different than, you know, what I faced in America. So, mm-hmm. you know, they don't have the, uh, you know, they get the, just the brick walls. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I was staying in, uh, with the Tosabia, yeah. the, the old buildings, you know, the, the seven building, right? Yeah. So it, was, it, it wasn't like the new ones. The new ones were nice and taken care of, et cetera. Nah, I was, I was roughing it out, you know? <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, that's 2012. 2012 from January to about May, I think. Yes, Ajib, so it's really weird, actually, Allah, you mentioned it, because I came to Medina in September 2012. And when I came, we had a similar, similar story, in a way, where yeah. I tried to bring my family, and I couldn't, because the same thing, the windows were closed in terms of doing this, the fam, do the yeah. When I went to yeah, Umar, yeah. when I went to Umar, 
I applied as well, and then I mm. got accepted the next year. Mashallah, Mashallah. And then I worked out when I was about to leave to go back for the holidays and then come back to Umar Fara. I got the yeah. visa. Like my visa. That's when they opened it because they opened it at the end of. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah, when you left, probably towards the end of the year. That's when they opened it. Subhanallah. Yeah, no, actually, you. So you came. If you came in September 2012, then that means you came the semester after me because I became in the beginning of 2012. Yeah, January. exactly. So when I when I came. Um, yeah, it was completely closed. But I remember, subhanAllah, after I came to Riyadh, brothers, close brothers of mine, close friends of mine in Medina, they're like, bro, you're not going to believe what just happened. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm like, what's up? What's up? They're like, yo, they just opened up. It's stick down. You can bring families now. And I'm just like, Allah, my chef. It, it was a hard pill to take. I was like, okay. I, I yeah, just had Alhamdulillah, bless you, brother. Alhamdulillah. Except the van, you know. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. It was a name, alhamdulillah. It worked out, you know, there were some benefits that came later that I had to keep reminding myself of. For, for example, getting close with some of the mashayikh here, you know, whereas it's very hard to get close with scholars in Medina, or it's harder, I should say. Um, you know, Sheikh Fawzan being here, and some of the other scholars who you can go and see, you know, on a close, you know, one-on-one -on -one basis. I can easily visit Sheikh Fawzan, and, you know, the legend, I easily visit Sheikh Luhaydan, easily visit others from amongst the scholars. So, alhamdulillah, there were some benefits. So okay, after that period when you um, obviously went now, so obviously you've gone back. When have you come back to the to actually study and start the actual you know, semester in terms of um, general Imam studying? Yeah, so I came um, the beginning of September 2012. The beginning of tw September 2012. Because I left around maybe May. I didn't even take the final exams in, in uh, the Mahat. Because I, I knew I was taking Kodos Nihai, there was no point to me. So I left early to prepare for my studies to go to the Jamal Tari Imam in Riyadh. So I came back in September. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, but, okay, so that's interesting, uh, So if you, obviously, you sat the whole semester. You didn't do the exam, but you sat the whole semester in Musa'a Awad. Mm. Yes, Musa'a Awad, mm. right? I'm sorry? Yeah, it was Musa'a Awad. Yeah, so comparing the two Arabic institutes, Medina University and Jamal Tari Imam in Riyadh, can you mm. tell us a little bit what you think the pros and cons for the both and what's the difference between you two? Um, I think the Jamaat Imam books, they're a bit different as far as they separate every different uh, subject matter. So they subject the Ta'bir book from the Nahu book, from the grammar book, from the conversation book, from the Sarf book. Whereas in Medina, it was kind of like all thrown in one, right? Which was like the, uh, what was mm -hmm. it, the Ta'bir or Tajribat or something like that. Yeah. So it was all one book yeah. pretty much, you know? Yeah. And they had, yeah, yeah exactly. The only thing that was separate in Medina, I think it was like Tawheed and Kira'a or something like that. Uh, so that was one. They they pretty much put the subjects in a more organized manner in Jamaat Imam. Um, but besides that, obviously I was only there for one semester in Jamaat Islamia, so I can't really speak too much more upon that because I didn't study the books in, in its totality. But that's one of the biggest things that I've seen. <clears throat> the other thing I want to ask you now, if you can just take the mic away, just let us know how the curriculum works in Jamaat Imam from the Arabic Institute all the way until a person graduates and the different faculties that you guys have. Okay, yeah. When I first came, um, the Mahad was three years. You had two years of the Arabic program and then you had diploma. So you had two years, you had three years total in that building, but uh, two years was the Mahad. So you learn Arabic, Mustawa Awul, the first level up until the fourth level. And then you get a separate certificate in diploma which is one year program, which is more like a, it's like a, uh, uh, a pre-course to the university. You know, they teach you a little bit more grammar. They teach you a little bit more uh, in-depth Akida and stuff like this. Um, usually brothers take that opportunity and diploma uh, to touch up on the Quran, memorize more, et cetera, because nobody really took it that serious. Unfortunately, a lot of people didn't take it serious. Yeah, so, so it's not mandatory. Um, it's not really mandatory. It's more like a, it was more like a waiting period for your paper to get processed from the, the Mahat to the uh, university. So they came up with this diploma program to see, cause you, before going into university, you had to make sure your grades were of J Jiddin, which was, you know, very good to excellent Montez. And they process all the paperwork from there to the university faculty program. So during that, they came up with this program, which was the diploma program. So it wasn't mandatory. Some people would take Tajir. They would, they would take an absence, leave of absence the entire year, go back to their country, and then come back when their, their acceptance came, their Kabul came for the university. 
me, I decided to stay and uh, do the diploma and also make some more money because I had family and take care of some things. So alhamdulillah, that was that, that was that three year stage. Then after that, you, you pick the kulia that you want to go into, the college you want to go to, the faculty. Is that still ha- as it runs up until today? Is it still a thing where it's three years? Yeah, so they did away with it maybe like, uh, I want to say two years ago, if I, if I remember correctly. One or two years ago, they, they did away with it. So now the Arabic program is only two years, like every other university now. And then you go right directly into the university. Okay. Yeah. So then the university, uh, after you're done with your diploma, during my time, you will pick you know, which kulia, which faculty you want to go into. So the main faculties that people went into uh, from the Islamic faculties would be Sharia, uh, which is it's like Islamic law, uh, Asul uh, which is mine, which is the fundamental principles or theology. And then you had Dawah, and then you had Arabic. Dawah now in our university, they pretty much did away with it. Now you can only do that for higher studies. But as far as a bachelor's, you can't go to Dawah anymore. So you have to go to either Asul if you want Islamic studies, so the deen, um, Arabic or Sharia. And they have a lot of other, you know, faculties, you know, from the, uh, you know, like engineering, other than Islamic faculties, like engineering and um, what is it, economics and things like this. So, yeah, alhamdulillah. And then in my faculty, which is a Suda deen, um, you go, it's broken into three. So you can go into, after the fourth level, you can t- pick up the hustles, you can pick a major. So you pick a major in either Qasim al-Sunnah, the uh, Sunnah faculty or the Sunnah uh, major, or Aqidah, you know, or uh, Quran. Okay, so, I'm going to cut you just to split it yeah, down. No problem, yeah, no problem. No problem. Uh, <laughs> because, so you're saying that you want a sort of dean after uh, the fourth level, which is two years. So you study two yes. years, which is like a yes. general kind of a sort of dean study. Exactly. So what do yeah, you so cover within them, within them two years? Just give us like a summary. What do you guys cover? Okay, perfect. So in them two years, you're required to take um, the mandatory basics of the Surah Deen, which would be Quran. So you learn how to memorize Quran, the first four semesters, the five semesters, where you were doing two, two juz every semester. So, and they were from, they weren't from the beginning of the Quran. They were from the end of the Quran. So you start from the end of the Quran, two juz each semester. Um, so you should have, what is that? Eight to 10 juz by level four, level five. Then you also had Tilawa. You had to recite the Quran. This was a separate course, learning how to read it, learning how to read it started from the beginning. So you would go through it. You would have Tajweed as well. that helped you with your Tajweed. Um, you had basic grammar. Um, you had, uh, history studies. Um, you had, uh, what is it? When you say history, is that, is that, is that the history of the Prophet Sallam, the biography? Or yeah, the, the, of the Memlika of Saudi Arabia. Okay. So, yeah, you, so you had that, and you also had, um, you know, Tariq al-Sunnah, so the history of the Sunnah, uh, Tilawa, and you had, um, what is it, Kira'at. You had a lot of these different basic things that were, like, Mushtarak, they were between all of the, all of the Tachasas, all of the majors, whether you go into Sunnah, Quran, or Aqidah. They were all together. You needed these basics. Okay. And then after that, once you go into your, your major, you're studying in some of the more in-depth things connected to your major, obviously. So, so for, if I went to Aqidah, we went into a lot more of, you know, Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah's books, a lot more of Ibn Qayyim's books, a lot more of Imam Ahmed, who was even prior and earlier, obviously. And in these kutub of Sunnah, the books of the Sunnah, obviously you have some, you know, teachers who might say, you know, give you a madhakara, <laughs> you know, the 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 study and not go through the exact book, but you had some, alhamdulillah, who will give you the book and the asal of it. And that was what you were studying from. So that was nice, alhamdulillah. I, I enjoyed that. Um, but it wasn't until, uh, alhamdulillah, I went to master's where I felt like my studies like really started, if that really makes sense. I felt like that still, even that stuff that we were studying from Ted Maria and um, uh, different books that was in my major, when we went into master's, it was a completely different level, completely different ballgame. You know, you're studying books that you only hear about, or some of them I didn't even know about. I'd had no clue about, but they were like authentic books of the Sunnah, and you got professors teaching you. You don't got just, you know, some student who's getting his master's or some student who's getting his PhD at the time, who's not really a tachasas yet, but, you know, they threw him in and need some extra faculty. But you had somebody who, who was Ustav, 
Doctor, someone who had the elephant for their name, you know, where they had books and they have, you know, a level within the university. And I never seen most of the teachers who were teaching me in, in masters. I never seen them throughout my faculty years. I only met them in higher studies, and they were along about it. I was blessed to have some of the best teachers, and it was uh, it was very nice. It was a good good experience. Alhamdulillah. So you know, you said the first two years. You studied that, which is obviously general for all the other faculties and colleges. And then mm -hmm. I believe that's then you have an extra two years to actually choose that which you want to specify. Mm -hmm. All together, yeah. years, correct? Yeah, all together is four years, yes. So, what are the three that you said are from the Usul of Deen? What are the three choices that you have in terms of that which you can specify? So, from Usul of Deen, you had to, you mean from the faculty you can pick? Yeah, meaning once you yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, once you're in the kulia of a Suladin, you have the Qasim Sunnah, okay. you have the faculty for Sunnah, which is Hadith, etc., Asanid, Takhrij, you go into that a little bit more in depth. Um, then you go into, you have Quran, which you go through Qira'at more, so you go through the Tariq and all these other things along with that. And then you have Qasim uh, Aqidah, which was me, or Aqidah wal Mudahib al Muasra. So it was the creed, Islamic creed, along with the um, different methodologies or different uh, understandings which are taking place from the, today, which is like all the isms, liberalism, yeah. um, et cetera. And how about Sharia? So Sharia, um, you don't have that same, you don't have that same pick. You don't have that same, like, you can go into any type of, you know, specific, you know, um, major, but rather it's all together. And it's based upon more so like fiqh, a sort of fiqh, et cetera. You know, you'd have to ask the brothers what, what exactly they study. <laughs> but, okay. uh, okay, yeah. 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 <laughs> so basically, in Sharia, it's, it's the, the, what I want to say, the reason I ask you because how you guys have it in Sharia, obviously, in there, that's how we have it all the Kuliya. Meaning, once you go mm -hmm. to the actual faculty, that's it. That's your Tukhasas. So I actually mm -hmm. didn't know that once you guys go into that, for example, yourself, it's sort of being, you can choose the three. Yeah, alhamdulillah. That was actually, from what I, from what I was told, it was something that used to be the old way. And then somewhere along the line, they changed it in a Saladin. They changed it and made it where it was kind of like how you said, you know, Sharia, where it was all in one. Yeah. And then like a year prior to me picking my which kuli I want to go into, which I was already kind of confused. I didn't really know. I wanted to go into Sharia, brother was saying going to Sharia, and he was studying, you know, Zada Mustaqna and all these big books and that you need. And then uh, obviously I was still coming from my background being a new Muslim. I really leaned toward, you know, Aqidah and a Saladin, etc. So Maybe the year before I picked the kulia or the semester before, I can't remember right now, they said that they, they announced they changed the curriculum. And now you get to choose whether you want to go into Quran, Aqidah, or Hadith. And to me, that was like, khalas, it's a no-brainer. Now I know, because now I get to go into mm -hmm. Aqidah more so now, and I wanted to go into that. So it was a no-brainer for me, alhamdulillah. And what was the last uh, faculty of the Quran? Uh, so it was the, um, you mean from the, amongst all the, the kuliyat, so you had yeah. Sharia, you had, um, Suradin, and you had Luga, okay. you had, you know, Arabic language, mm -hmm. and you asked, you also had, at my time, you had a da'wah, but da'wah now has been closed off, and you can only do that in a higher studies, you can only pick it for, like, a, you know, a master's or a PhD. Okay, so, okay, the main thing now that I want to ask you is to do with master's, okay, first question, okay. give us, like, a detailed how many years is it? What year are you in? How does it work, the actual program? Okay. So, um, master's, uh, the, in my tachasus, it's, uh, you go into one year, which they call dirasat al, uh, what is it? Uh, like a dirasat al am or something mm -hmm. along these lines where you just take the basics of what they want to perform to you. How to study uh, aqidah books. How to write about aqidah books how to grasp the overall goal and do comparative research. Um, what are the masadir? What are the source books connected to Aqidah? What are uh, different ways you can write in Aqidah? All these different things, they, they give it to you the first year. And mine is different from like brothers who are studying like a Durasa Tekmili. Durasa Tekmili is pretty much where you're kind of got, you got guided assistance with your writing and your research paper isn't meant to be that long. I think it's only from 120 pages to 250. Me, I'm going through a risala. So I have to do a thesis, a, a big thesis paper. So that means that I have one year of study, which I just finished. Actually, I have another exam uh, in two days, my last exam. 
And then I started, I mean, and then I put forth um, a topic uh, that I want to write about and I get three years to complete it. So it's, three years. Three four years. it's supposed to be about four years. And inshallah, I'll try to, I hope to make it <laughs> not that long. <laughs> I'll give you I mean, so yeah, alhamdulillah, it's, 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 it's Jay. It's, it's very nice. And it was a, 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 big, a big blessing going to the magister. Even though there were some brothers, I remember there were some students who were advising me like, you know, you don't need masters. Come back and give da'wah. You know, you can, you know, come, you can come back with just a bachelor's and heck, you don't even need to graduate. Just come back and, you know, push the da'wah, et cetera. And I just, it never sat right with me, you know, like being a new Muslim, wanting to study more. And I'm just like, well, I mean, the program's there for a reason, you know? So mm -hmm. I went into it and I, uh, I learned some, some, some beautiful things, you know, as far as even authoring, you know, I was talking to one of my teachers, one of my professors recently, uh, Sheikh Muhammad al, -Al Ashaya, and he was, you know, discussing, because he taught us um, Asul al-Bath, and he also taught us Masadr al-Bath. So Asul al-Bath pretty much teaches you what your thesis paper needs to have, what are the sources that must be there, how to come up with them, how to construct it, etc. So he pretty much teaches you how to author in, in, in its essence, because your research paper has to be anywhere from 280 pages to 800 pages. So it can't be something which is, is you know, just anything put together. It has to be something which is constructed in a proper manner. So I told him, you know, Jazalallahu khair, that, you know, uh, I haven't had a teacher like him in that aspect, and I benefit a lot tremendously, um, even though the final exam was very difficult. And <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how I did, but alhamdulillah, I still benefit from, you know, all that, the stuff that he put forth. It was, it was amazing, alhamdulillah. Uh, um, so, Akhi, what I wanted to ask you is, um, with regards to, I'm going to rewind a little bit back. Yeah, when no problem. You actually choose to be masters. And the second question is, how did you go about in terms of doing the exam to actually get accepted? Was it difficult? Was it hard? And what's the difference between the two? Bachelors okay. and the masters. Yeah, so, um, uh, how did I get accepted? Is That was your first question, I believe, right? Yeah. Oh, so, so what I did... Why? Why did you want to why why did you choose Okay. Yeah, I wanted to choose for, you know, the obvious reasons, you know, staying in Saudi Arabia a little longer, staying along with the scholars a lot longer. You know, I have family, you know, who uh, my ch children are also going to school here and benefit, et cetera. But also because, you know, when well, that hamd, I mean it's a it's an education which is free and you're being you get the opportunity to come here, study under good professors, and you know, study as long as you as you're able to. So long as your grades are correct and your manner is conducted in a certain way. So when I had the ability to, to apply for master's, um, to me, it was kind of like a no-brainer because I wanted to extend my studies more. I still felt like after I graduated bachelor's that I didn't have, you know, the keys that I was really, you know, that I came to achieve. You know, I wanted to get stronger in a few different things and a few different sciences. So when I get, went into the master's, well, when I applied to master's, I really wanted to go into Aqidah in a more in-depth way. Uh, aspect so for me it was not a no-brainer because that's what i wanted to do i wanted to look into it and, and alhamdulillah i got the opportunity to do that so you're not looking like just at the uh, the general books of aqidah when you're at when you're in a master's program you're also looking into the books of the mukhalifin the books of the you know innovators or those people who have the wrong interpretation of islam and you're doing comparative research and why they were wrong so to me it, it helped me also with madahab and ma'asara dealing with the different isms you know especially in today's day and age you know, it gives you a background of where they come from, how they get to where they get, why they say what they, what they, what they say. And you can kind of like debunk their argument before it even comes to you. You know where they're going to go with it because you know they're a soul in which they believe. So to me, it was, uh, that's what made me want to go to master's. I remember having a teacher in a bachelor's program and he would just quote Ibn Taymiyyah and he would refute all the different, you know, uh, isms and the different groups and sects. And I just remember thinking to myself, wow, that's amazing. Like, it seems like he has all the answers. Like, he knows how to go about looking at these different things which come up from a Khalifat, and he has the proof to, to support it. And I remember thinking to myself, I want to get some keys like that. I remember being moved, like, you know, like, I want to know why this is completely wrong. I don't want to just follow, you know, a fatwa of so-and-so, but I also want to understand why they got that fatwa, how they come to that, you know, that ruling, etc. cetera. And uh, alhamdulillah, it was good for me to go into master's. Um, the second question, I'm sorry, what was it? 
Second question was, how did you go about doing the exam? Was it difficult? Was it hard? Okay, yeah. So exams, so our, our university is a bit different. Every university tends to have their own way of how, you know, they accept students. Um, in my university, we didn't have to take a, uh, a written exam. Like in general, some of you have taken like two exams even. Uh, a written exam for the tachastos and something for, you know, basic knowledge of some of the sciences. Whereas us, you know, we had an exam by way of uh, interviews. So we had to go through the administration building and they sat down with me, first and foremost, asked me different questions, looked at my grade point average, looked at where I was coming from, um, et cetera. And if you answer in accordance with that and your grades are in, intact, et cetera, then they push you forward to the, the kulia and what you're going to apply for. That kulia, they do a more in-depth uh, background of you. And they ask you questions which are going to be difficult. And you can't prepare for it because there's no book or nothing. They just say, your interview is going to be such and such a day. On that day, just be completely faulty. Be completely open. And I remember sitting there that day and I was just mm -hmm. waiting, waiting. And I got a message from um, the secretary of Aqidah, the, the office of Aqidah. And he said, enter into this, this Zoom link. Right? And I was like, okay, enter it in. It was like a legend of like, I thought it was supposed to be only three teachers. It was five. It was five. And um, one of the, I was familiar with one of them. He taught me in the bachelor's program. But there was questions coming from all over the place. It was like I was just being tested on things that I didn't even study since so old. And being completely honest, there was some questions I didn't know. <laughs> like there might have been like two or three that I just, was, it went over my head. And I felt so embarrassed, I remember. And then some that I felt confident, like, okay, I got this. I remember just walking away from that interview. This is about a year ago now. I remember walking away from that interview like, I don't know. I remember, I think I talked to my family. I was like, yeah, so we need to uh, look for a plan B. <laughs> we, just, we, we don't, we don't, we don't we see what's going to work because uh, this, this, is, this isn't it. It's time to start well, working. Is that how it goes for every single student? Do you just get like a random like call or meaning that obviously because of COVID? Yeah, so they, so they tell you pretty much like um, this day is going to be your interview. Um, this day, be ready. Um, they'll tell you who should be on the panel to question you, who's the, the teachers who should be on the panel. And then um, that was for my tichas, that was for Akhida. That, that was, so we all did it that same way. It was about maybe, it was Sheikh Mohammed al Shayat told me there was over 200 people who applied for Akhida. 200, over 200 many? students. I'm sorry? How many go in? Yeah, so once it got down to the Muqabila session, once they ciphered down to who made it past the admin interview to go to the Kuli interview, we were down to about 19 students from the Tulab al -Minah. So that was, I don't know how many was from the Saudis. And then um, after that Muqabila, we went down to only, they, they told us only two Tulab al can be accepted. Only two Tulab al can be accepted for Aqidah. And um, alhamdulillah, some brothers spoke to the admin, etc. So it went back up to about five people being accepted. And alhamdulillah, my name was on the list uh, for that five people out of over 200 people applied. So alhamdulillah, I remember getting a message from the same secretary who sent me the Zoom link. And he's like, you know, congratulations. May Allah bless you. And great to tell Fig. You know, you've been accepted. You know, your papers got sent back to so-and-so. Check with this, this, this. And I was like, alhamdulillah. So alhamdulillah, out of, out of that. And there were some students I remember. I'm from the Tulab al who were very strong, you know, coming from Nigeria, they had Hef, et cetera. Um, and I was like, after that interview, I told you, I didn't, I didn't feel comfortable. I was like, uh, yeah, plan B. So I was kind of already taking it. I, had, I remember I had a job uh, interview at another school, international school here, because I knew, or I, I didn't know, but I, I figured that it wasn't going to look right. So alhamdulillah, I got accepted, and that's, and that's how it went. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> Um, the other question I wanted to ask you was in terms of like um, obviously you said to us it's four years the thing that's different I want you to kind of touch on or highlight because a lot of people in the West believe that a master's or a postgraduate in the West is similar or there is no difference to, to uh, you know a master's in you know Islamic uh, studies in terms of like Saudi Arabia and they believe the only difference is just the language obviously Without a doubt, we all know where there's a Maqash. And internally, that entails that actual muscle uh, program in Saudi Arabia is much more intense. So if you can just highlight that point about a lot of people. Okay, yeah. So um, 
people who say the master's program is the same as the Western, is that what you're saying? I'm sorry. Yeah, Let's skip that a little bit. Obviously, yeah. For example, I was, here in UK, it's one year. Mm, yeah. And I think in America, it might be two years. So I would say, did, did they ever do the master's here? That'll be the first <laughs> question. Because <laughs> if they did the master's here, then there's no way you can make that type of statement because um, it's completely different. It's completely different. I mean, the first and foremost, the competitiveness of getting into the master's itself, you know, being, you know, vented, et cetera, is difficult. You know, the exams or the interviews and the grades, that's difficult in itself. Whereas in the West, last time I checked, as long as you have the money, you could put forfeit the money and you can get into the program. It's not as competitive from what I remember. I'm not sure how it is in the UK, but from the States, that's the same way. Yeah. So in America, I mean, in Saudi Arabia, you can't do that. Uh, as far as it being difficult, I mean, you, in my, in my tachasus, in uh, Surah Deen, you can't even move on in the masses. Like, I remember my, one of my teachers told us the first day, he's like, just because, and we only started with 10 students, remind you, only 10 students were with me in my, in my small group. He's like, you know, just because you made it here does not mean you're going to make it throughout your master's. Don't think just because you're here the first day that you're going to be here. There's going to be some of you that's not going to be here. And also, you can't continue on to the second semester of studies unless you have over a certain grade point average. Or else they'll kick you out. They'll give you, I think, one opportunity to make it up, you know, get your grades up. And that will be the year after because the, the master's only goes by yearly. So you have to go with the next, the next group of students. Or you'll get kicked out completely. So I wouldn't say that there's, there's no comparison, you know, and the amount of work that you're being thrown out. We only had three days of classes, but it felt like we had seven days of classes because the amount of work and the amount of research papers you have to do weekly, homework assignments, research, reading, reports, uh, debates, even in class, you have a small group. So it's a teacher amongst 10, and it's more like they're teaching you by way of giving you different things to do, and they just sit back. They want to see what you think about it. So you come into the classroom, you prepare, you put forth that which you did throughout the week. Okay. And some teachers will straight up tell you, you know, this is, this is garbage. I remember one brother was, um, it sounded like, because this was on board this year, it was on Zoom. So we were all at home while we were doing studies. But it sounded like he was crying. It seemed like he was crying because the teacher really ripped into his stuff. And we didn't know if he was going to make it. We didn't know about a few of us. You know, a few of us was in that group. We didn't know because some people's work wasn't up to standard. In the West, do they get that same type of stress? Or is it just as long as you got your aid, your financial aid, or your money that you can go forth? This, the, this, the, the, the teachers here, they really looked at the um, academic level of the student. So if, you don't, if you're not up to par, then you can't go and say, I'm studying a master's in German to Imam. I don't know how it is in other universities but they will not allow you to go on to write your risala. And even when you put your risala forward, that has to be accepted. So you have to put, uh, you know, the thesis that you want to write, you have to put it in a way that could be understood on an academic level. And it has to be a proficiency. And then once you put it forth, they can say, this is completely garbage. We don't want it. Come up with something new. Or they can critique it to how it should be a little better. But I've had people tell me they put forth maybe four different things, five different things, all of them getting refused. Does that happen, you know, in the West? I don't know. But all I know is the studies here is definitely more intense from what I've seen. Um, it's definitely more um, competitive. Uh, it's a lot. It's, it's a lot. Honestly, when you say that they, they, they get rejected, yeah, people have to understand that obviously they're looking at your punctuation. Now, the grammar, there's so, so many things that they're looking at. It's not just yeah. like, using the sources where they come from in the Saudi. So it's kind of like it's, it's very, very different when you think of it compared to you know masters in the West. And if you can just touch on the Munakasha, you can just because obviously that does not happen, uh, I believe, in to my knowledge, that that does not happen in, in the West. Yeah, so the, the Munakasha, which is the debate of your thesis. Um, that was, that, that, that's something they, they, they get you to practice for while you're studying. So that first year of studies, uh, while you're doing Risala, they get you, that's why they have you do research papers and come because they want you to practice doing your debate. Why, why did you write what you wrote here? Um, on the bigger scale, when you're done with your big thesis, 
And this is, of course, with an academic advisor to help you out throughout it to show, you know, what's good and what's not. Then you debate on a big scale. And when you're doing a risala, we get three hours. Three hours, you, your risala, your thesis paper, and three judges on a panel, pretty much just picking your stuff apart. They're going to look for anything that might be uh, something of a mistake or could have been written better and, or challenging you on the knowledge in which you claim to have put it here. Why did you put this on this page and not this page? Why did you say this and not this? Um, what's the difference between, you know, what you said here in chapter eight versus what you said here in chapter 20? All these different things get um, examined from a critical eye and uh, you got to be up to par. You got to be ready uh, because it's going, it gets intense. <laughs> Yeah. The last uh, one topic and the last thing I will kind of end on, on this note, inshallah, is if you have any pieces of advice to those that want to apply to Jannah to Imam, how they can do so, and also just in general, any pieces of advice I you can end uh, this uh, meeting with. Okay. Yeah, so um, closing advice, I would say, um, as far as people want to apply, then they tend to put something out either January or August on their Twitter, the university Twitter. And I tend to retweet it or I translate it and put it up as well. And so people can apply within that period. It's usually um, not something like what you know, like months ahead. You just know generally when it will be come out. So it'll be either be January or August. Once that comes out, you're given a few weeks to apply. Uh, once you apply, then they'll get back to you, whether by email or whether by putting a list out and some students reach out or whatever the case may be. Um, so I would say if people want to apply, look for it uh, in August, July, August, and look for it in December, January. Uh, as far as new students who are coming, my advice would be um, come with sincerity, come with ikhlas, come with a true, uh, you know, uh, sincere heart of why you want to come. Because that's going to be your guest that's going to keep you here for all these years. Being here for two years in the Mahat, then four years in the Kulia, some people longer, family things come up, you might take that jid, you might take a leave of absence, whatever. Only thing that's going to keep you there through all these difficulties is remembering why you came, remembering why you're there, remembering the, the end goal. So I would say come with the class, come with the sincerity, and um, don't rush into things. Always look for advice from people who have come before you, uh, scholars, uh, other students from your country, et cetera. And um, I mean, honestly, there could be so many advices uh, that can be given to a new student, so many mistakes that I made personally. Um, and I look back at it and it was, it was a learning experience. But had I had somebody who preceded me uh, to make things a little bit more direct and clear to follow, it had been a lot easier, I think. But uh, there's tons of, there's really tons, tons of advice that a new student needs to know. And that's going to be on another podcast or something or another meeting. I think that's, 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 that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and just any last piece of advice Akhi, for the general folks that are watching in terms of seeking knowledge for those that are not able to come with them. Nah, uh, alhamdulillah, we're in the last few days of Ramadan, the last two weeks, and blessed times and blessed nights. So uh, in these times, take advantage because next Ramadan is not guaranteed. Uh, we have Nilid al-Qadr, which could be upon us, try to stay Stand in the Qadr, Iman and Wahtisab with firm, firm faith and seeking the reward of Allah Taala, and um, you know, always refer back to you know having ikhlas about this ibadah. Mm -hmm. And I just fear I would just advise all the brothers and sisters who's listening, you know, who are not from the students, you know, just to um, be sincere and always seek out Quran and Sunnah from its authentic uh, sources. And may Allah grant us all tawfiq. <laughs> enable you to be of benefit to this ummah uh, it was a pleasure for having you here on this channel can Allah preserve you and inshallah we'll see you all thanks for having me I really appreciate it Jazakallah khair Jazakallah khair Thank you 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 Thank you